Welcome back to our Chapter 6 uh, videos uh, from Zane State Physics class. At the end of the last video, we were right in the middle of this example problem. We were trying to figure out how much work this hiker is doing on his backpack as he travels up this incline plane. And so work is equal to FD cosine of theta. The uh, force he has to apply to the backpack to keep it suspended has to be equal and opposite to its weight, which is mg. So fh is equal to mg. And if we look at the, um, the force he's applying to his backpack versus the distance that he is traveling, the direction he is going, that makes an angle of theta. And so the component of his force he's applying that is parallel to that direction is um, the force times cosine of theta. So that's where the, the cosine of theta comes into play. So we have his force is mg times d times cosine of theta. But what is that distance d? If we look at this slope he's going up, it makes a right triangle. We are given that the height he um, goes up is 10 meters, but then we need to figure out what that length is. So using right triangle trigonometry, we said that cosine of theta is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, which is 10 over d. If we solve this equation for d, we get d is equal to 10 over cosine of theta. And then we can substitute that into this equation, which now becomes mg times 10, I should say 10.0, over cosine of theta times cosine of theta. And look what happens here. The cosine of thetas cancel out. And so this equation now becomes work is equal to 10.0 times mg. OK, and so 10.0 times the mass of the backpack is 15 kilograms, 15.0 kilograms. And the acceleration due to gravity is 9.80 meters per second squared. And so the work done is 1470 joules, 1470 joules. Um, when rounded to three significant figures. Um, so that's the work he is doing on the backpack. But if we look at the negative work done by gravity, it is mg times cosine of theta. mg cosine of theta. Uh, MGD, I should say, MGD cosine of theta, because MG is the force, F, D is the distance traveled, uh, cosine of theta, and uh, if we plug in here, D is still the same, so this is now going to become MG 10.0 over cosine of theta times cosine of theta, and those will cancel out, and we're left with the exact same amount, 10.0 mg, which is 1470 joules. It's just that the work is going in the opposite direction, uh, the work due to gravity. So it is negative. It's negative work. And so if we combine these two, 1470 that he does on his backpack, and the negative work of 1470 done by gravity, the net work that is done here is zero. So there is zero net work done on the backpack, uh, which can be a little bit confusing. But um, basically what we're saying here is, yes, the hiker is doing work on this backpack. Uh, by applying uh, his force in the upward direction. But gravity is doing the same amount of work um, in the opposite direction. 
So when we combine those two things, they get canceled out. And so in this slide, that just summarizes what I just said. Gravity is doing the same amount of work in the opposite direction. It's doing negative work, and so those things cancel out. The net work on the system is, in fact, zero. Now, if you think back to the chapter where we talked about circular motion, um, like in this example here, the, the moon orbiting the Earth, the direction at any one given point in time, the instantaneous direction or velocity of the moon is tangent to the orbit, but the force of gravity that's holding the moon in that orbit is going towards the center of the Earth. So we have a situation here um, similar to the guy that was holding the bag of groceries. The direction is perpendicular to the force. And so if we looked at uh, our formula for work equals F D cosine of theta, cosine of theta, and theta is 90, cosine of 90 equals 0. So this would be F D times 0, which of course makes it 0. So there is no work being done in this situation. So centripetal forces do no work. And that's because of the um, orientation or relationship between the distance uh, being traveled and the force being applied. Because they're perpendicular to each other, that results in zero work being done. So energy is another word that is commonly used. We may think we know what energy is, but do we really? So let's um, define it simply um, in the physical sense, in the scientific sense. Energy is the ability to do work. So um, they share units. Uh, so energy is, the unit of energy is the joule. Uh, and so if you have, let's say, 100 joules worth of energy, you can use that to do 100 joules of work. Energy and work. Okay, so if you have energy, you can do work. Um, if you don't have energy, you cannot do work. And there are different types of energy that we could talk about. The first is kinetic energy, K-E, kinetic energy, the word kinetic uh, meaning in motion. And so this is the energy of motion. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared. m is mass and v is velocity. So if you have a moving object and it is really large, if it has a, a lot of mass, then it will have a lot of energy or if it's moving very fast. A fast moving object has a lot of kinetic energy. And then of course, if it's really massive and moving fast, then it has uh, even more kinetic energy. So if we were to look at some type of system, like a car rolling down the street, um, and we had sort of a before and after situation, we could determine the amount of work done, the net work done on that system, by looking at the change in kinetic energy. So if we have um, 1 half mv1, which is the amount of energy that we have to start with, and 1 half mv squared, and that's the kinetic energy that we end with. If we look at the difference in kinetic energy between uh, the starting point and the ending point, that tells us how much our energy level changed, which is equivalent to how much work was being done. So let's put that principle into practice here. Um, we have a 10,000 kilogram train 
that is traveling at 17 meters per second. And we want to bring that to a stop. We want to uh, stop the train. How much work is going to need to be done on that train in order to stop it? So uh, rather than taking the approach of work equals FD, because we don't know how far the train will travel by the time we stop it. Instead, let's look at work equals the change in kinetic energy. So we're not going to use that formula. We're going to take the approach of work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So we have 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. So if we want to bring it to a stop, then that means that the final velocity is going to be zero. And so one half m times zero squared um, is just going to be zero. That's going to make that whole term zero. And then we're going to uh, subtract from that one half. The mass of our train is 10,000 kilograms. And its initial velocity was 17 meters per second. Uh, so we've got 1 half mv squared. So don't forget to square it. And so that equals 1,445,000 joules. Uh, and it's negative, by the way. That's negative 1,000,000. 445,000 uh, joules. Uh, and the negative just means that the um, work it has to be done in a direction opposite what the train is moving. So if the train is moving to the right, we have to do our work to the left in order to stop it. And if we look at significant figures here, um, again, the way the textbook author seems to be thinking is uh, he gives us 10,000. Are these zeros significant or not? I think instead we need to look at this number that gives us four significant figures and assume that at least four of these are meant to be significant as well. So we have these four digits being significant. And um, rather than just leaving these trailing zeros there, it's probably better to write this as negative 1445 kilojoules, or we could say 1.445 megajoules. So uh, I would say either of these two ways of using metric prefixes rather than trailing zeros would be preferable. Moving on from kinetic energy, our next type of energy we're going to discuss is potential energy. So potential energy is essentially energy that is stored up and can be used at a later point in time. Some examples of those would be a wound up spring, like the spring in this mousetrap, a uh, stretched out rubber band, like you might have a slingshot, um, or just simply moving an object at some height above the ground. Uh, moving it up into the air gives it gravitational potential energy. So potential energy due to gravity is equal to mgy, mass times acceleration due to gravity times y, where y is some distance uh, measured from a frame of reference. So if we have an object at, at this point, and then we raise it up some distance y or h, the potential energy we are giving the object is mgy or mgh. Um, and this is not absolute, because the starting point can be anything we choose. So long as we define a reference point and measure up from there, we can describe the change in potential energy. That's going to bring me to the end of this video. We'll look at a potential energy example in the next one.